Today I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Bonnie Hackberth with the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. Uh, she joined that organization in April 2016 as Communications Director and serves as the primary contact for media regarding the Foundation. She also manages the Foundation's strategic communication effort and oversees the website and social media program, annual report, and other publications. In addition, she manages grants to several nonprofit media outlets and works to market, to market space, the Foundation's co-working space. Prior to joining the Foundation, Bonnie was a senior counselor at Guthrie Mays Public Relations for nearly 18 years, where she served numerous clients in the health, education, technology, and transportation fields. She also served in senior communication roles in the United States Senate, the White House Office of Consumer Affairs, and the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Bonnie earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Communications and Public Relations from Washington State University and has done graduate work in public administration at George Washington University. Please help me welcome Bonnie as our speaker this morning. Thank you, and I'd also like to introduce our intern at the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky, Clay Barnett. Clay is an entering sophomore at the University of Kentucky, and he'll be studying international studies and global health issues. So we are thrilled to have him. Um, he's passing along a copy of my presentation. Um, we can go ahead and go to the first slide if that's all right. Um, our presentation today is about getting more media coverage in your various communities and getting better, more positive media coverage of the messages that you want to convey. And so I've been asked here by Kim Wells to um, give you a little bit of background on how to do the best interview you can do with the media. Now many of you are working with rural media and so you have a good relationship with them and that works out to your advantage because they know who you are and what you're interested in. In. Sometimes you're working with larger city media um, and even trade media in the various industries. So this is applicable across the board. The first thing that I want to talk to you about, and we can go to the next slide, please. It, or is this my control here? I can go ahead and I can do it myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the... Hmm, this is not the right one. This is the one that you pulled? I said it yesterday, this is not the right one. We'll start with, um, I sent it by uh, email, link to it yesterday. Um, so, the first question that you're going to ask when you're looking at the media interview opportunity is, is this a, an interview that I want to do? Because you can say no to an interview. And that's sort of a revelation to some people. We don't have to take in every interview that comes in. Now when you're in a small town and that's the media that you work with every day, obviously that's going to filter into that question. But the things that I want you to think about as you determine whether or not you want to do an interview are, what's the story about and do I have a message that I want to convey about that story? Who else is that reporter talking to? Is it just me and is it a story about my organization? Or am I just a small piece of a larger story? What kinds of questions is the reporter, are, are the reporter likely to ask? Now, that doesn't mean you can say, give me the questions in advance. That would be not the best way to handle that situation. But you can say, generally, what's your story about? What are you looking for so that I can be best prepared to speak with you? Will it be taped or live? How long will it be? Do you just need a couple of quotes or do I need to go ahead and prepare something a little longer for you so I'm ready to talk about a variety of issues? Is this a half hour radio show? Am I going to get call-ins? Okay, that's gonna give you an idea of what you're gonna be able to talk about. And then, like I said, know whether you're the focus of the story or if you're just a piece of a larger story. So know your audience what the storyline is, what the setting is. Is it radio? Is it TV? Is it print? How long is it going to be? Is it live? Are they just doing background research or are you actually doing this for quote that's going to be in tomorrow's paper? Okay? Those are the questions that you need to ask as you're moving forward and thinking about whether to do this interview. Now you've agreed to do the interview. My first caution to you is only say to that reporter, Anything that you would be comfortable with splashed across the headline of the front page tomorrow morning. Okay? So, you are the expert in whatever you're talking about. If you'd agreed to do this interview, it's because you're the expert. And so, only talk about what you own. 
Now that reporter might say, well, what do you think about this or this related topic? Or what do you think um, about, you know, somebody else's position on that? And I would caution you to say, I welcome you to talk to that person about that issue. What you own is what you should be talking about. And the idea is, tomorrow morning, in the daily newspaper or the weekly newspaper, the headline's talking about something that you're not really interested in pushing, that's not really in your bailiwick. But you might have said something interesting. That might, might what be what's on the front page of that newspaper headline. And that's not necessarily what you want. You have a reason for doing that interview. You have a message to share. Focus on that message. You do have a right to know the general area of questioning up front. That's because you'll need to be well prepared for the interview. And that's the reason that you give the reporter. You don't say, I want to have all your questions up front. But you say, what, am I, what are you looking for? What's your angle? Who else are you talking to? Because that's going to give you a feel for the kinds of questions you're going to get. So you can better prepare yourself. The crux of everything I'm saying today is that you can be better prepared for the interview so that you can control the message. Control is not a bad word here. It's a good word. You can figure out what you want to focus on and really stay down that path and not waver to places you don't necessarily want to go. Let's think about what you don't have the right to do in an interview. You do not have to, the right to edit, to edit or review a story before it runs. A lot of times I'll get work with someone who's fairly new to media relations and they'll say, can I see your story before it runs? And the answer is no. They're an independent journalist. It's their job to look at a variety of things and write the story. Um, that's why what you say and what comes out of your mouth is so important. And if you narrow your message and you know what you're talking about, then you'll know the next morning before you wake up and go out to the newspaper box and pull that newspaper what it's actually going to say because you only said a certain number of things. Okay, you didn't waver off topic. You also don't have the right to determine which portions of the interview get used. Again, that's why it's so important to narrow your message. Because if you spend 10 minutes of a 20-minute interview talking about something unrelated, they may use that in a different story. So, Now, if a reporter asks you if you would like to double check quotes or facts before the story runs, oh yeah, agree to that one. <laughs> You know, if they invite you to do so, you definitely want to take the opportunity to do that. When you do so, make sure that you're only correct, correcting actual errors and that you're not just tweaking the story. My next slide is about, and I'm not able to pull this, pull this slide. Okay, that's fine. What do we do with our hands in an interview? And I'm thinking particularly of a TV interview, but also in a sit-down interview. Now, I'm going to speak a little bit away from the mic so I can give you some show and tell, but a lot of us do what we call the fig leaf. Standing and putting our hands like this because we don't know what to do with them. Or we put our hands in our pockets, you know, and we look kind of casual. Or we do this. None of those look like you're comfortable in an interview setting. And so I invite you to try and practice this. Put your hands here. Start with them right here. And what you'll find is as you speak, they'll move naturally with you and you'll feel very comfortable with that. You also won't tend to grab them together, which makes you stiff. You also, in a podium situation, won't steer the podium, which makes you look very stiff and uncomfortable. If you try in front of your mirror at home, close the bathroom door so the spouse doesn't see you and the kids don't see you, put your hands right here and try talking. Try practicing a speech. This works just as well for speeches. An interview talking with somebody and putting your hands right here. I have found over and over and over that people are more natural when they do that and they look more comfortable and they have more credibility. A good chunk of whatever it is you say, especially in TV, is visual credibility. And this is a great way to gain that. Another thing about how do I sit, okay? A lot of times we'll see somebody sit like this. You want to lean back? We're comfortable, you know? I invite you not to do that. That's the way I do it. <laughs> In an interview setting, I invite you to come up on the edge of that chair, okay? Take our hands and do the very same thing we were doing before. You're going to be more engaged in an interview setting. 
in a speaking setting if you're on the edge of your chair and your hands like this so they can move as you talk. You're more animated. You have more credibility. Okay? So this is two really quick tricks that you can practice and learn in an interview setting that before you even open your mouth are going to give you more credibility. Okay. Other things about the very basics in doing an interview. Play it safe and be truthful. Okay? Don't speculate. Don't um, lie, <laughs> obviously. Don't guess. If you don't know the answer to something, it is a perfectly intelligent response to say, I don't know, I'll see if I can get that for you. Or I'll see if I can find someone who has that information. Or even to say, that's not an area we work in, let me see if I can't find someone who can help you with that. That's a very respectable, credible answer. Now, if it's something that your, your department is working on, your agency is working on, your community is working on, you can say, I don't have that at my fingertips, but I will get that for you. And then follow up, get that for the reporter. They won't use that I don't know piece, but they will think of you as a credible person. And that's what we're trying to do here is build credibility and a relationship with the media. Another key tip that's very simple and easy you don't have to fill awkward silences. If you're in an interview in a situation with a reporter and it goes silent for a minute, that is often a tool that reporters use to get you to say more. You don't have to fill that space. Now, I invite you to fill it with a message if you have one. But if the reporter's gone off into an area you don't want to go, it's perfectly fine Put your hands down, sit quietly, and wait for the next question. The awkward silence, even in a live interview, is not yours to fill. It's the reporter's. You don't have to do that. We all have that sensitivity, right? When we're talking with someone, we don't want awkward silence. That's the reporter's responsibility in an interview situation. Okay? Obviously, avoid jargon to the extent that you can. Try to speak in plain English. We all have jargon in the fields that we work in. We say grad. We say, you know, we want to try and say it, spell it out when we're talking to an audience. We want, especially in radio and TV interviews, we want to try and say the whole name. Okay? And try not to use jargon. Okay? I don't know, but I will check, as I said, is an appropriate answer. Always okay to say that. All right. A couple of more easy tips. At the beginning of an interview, again, particularly radio and TV, before you go live, a reporter is often going to ask the question, can you give me your, a, a mic check? Can you spell your name and title? This is an ideal time to say, hi, I'm Bonnie Hackbarth. It's spelled H-A-C-K-B-A-R-T-H. And I'm here today to talk to you about some very simple and easy tips that you can use to improve your media interviews. Take that opportunity not to stop after spelling your name and title, but give a message. And we're going to talk about messages in just a minute and how you craft them. But always take that easy opportunity at the beginning of the interview with that mic check or that sound check. I'm glad today to share with you the important reasons why the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky is really stepping up its efforts in Smoke Free that opportunity. At the same time, at the very end of an interview, you'll see a reporter very often say, is there anything else? Some people are so dang glad to get done with that interview, they say, no, nope, they're out of there. <laughs> Take that opportunity and share a message. Thank you so much for interviewing me. I reiterate that it's very important be we booking on smoke free because we can reduce Kentucky's deficit by such and such a money or whatever. Whatever your message is, take that opportunity. You got two softball questions, the beginning of the interview and the end of the interview. Never let those opportunities go. Those are the oftentimes you're so relaxed because it's the beginning you haven't started yet or it's the end, but that's going to be the best message you share. It's going to be clean, it's going to be unnervous, un all those things that make it sometimes get a message garbled up. So those are great opportunities. Now there are times when you're going to get negative questions in an interview. Questions where the reporter asks it in such a way that they've made some kind of assumption that is very negative. How do we deal with those? A lot of times you're not going to be doing a 60 minutes interview, but you are going to be doing an interview, or maybe it's a conversation with a constituent during a campaign, or maybe it's a conversation with a resident of your city or community, and they start with a negative assumption. 
Okay? All of these tools that I'm talking about today are useful not just in media interviews, but I would um, say also in one-on-one in, in -on -one conversations with constituents and, and residents and in speeches and public presentations. First of all, my golden rule, never repeat that negative phrase. So what we were told when we were in school was when a teacher asks us a question, we're supposed to rephrase the question into our answer, right? I'm telling you, don't do it. <laughs> okay? So the opportunity for you is to say a message and to neutralize the negative by going to a message. So let's say a reporter asks me, Bonnie, Kentucky has a tobacco heritage. There's no way you're going to be able to get more communities to pass smoke-free laws. You can't do it. So that's a negative. Instead of saying, gee, it is going to be really hard, or you're right, it's been very difficult, or that kind of thing, I will find a positive message. I will say, in fact, what we've found is that 71% of Kentuckians support a statewide smoke-free law. We see that there is the support. Okay? So I haven't agreed to that reporter's assumption. I've moved on to a positive message. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. What you're doing is you're neutralizing the negative, and then you're bridging to one of your messages. Okay? Another neutralizing the negative might be to just to say, reasonable people disagree. Here's what the data tell us. So you've, got, you've, you've acknowledged that somebody else feels differently, but you haven't, in fact, agreed to it. Okay. Another thing is be careful about nodding during a reporter's question, especially in TV, because the question may be negative. I had this wonderful gentleman I worked with, his name was Barry, when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, and he loved doing media interviews. And so throughout the entirety of a reporter asking a complicated question, he'd go like this. Because in his head he's saying, I know what you're saying, I know where you're going, I have the answer. But it might be a way negative question. Okay, so just be careful about that body language that you're exhibiting. Try to keep your hands neutral and listen. Take a moment and wait to respond. Again, the awkward silence is not yours to fill. And then go ahead and state your message. Okay, I would caution you, for the most part, avoid arguing with a reporter. Media by their ink by the barrel is the old saying from my day. I'm now showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> but the opportunity is to say something like, reasonable people disagree, here's why I stand where I stand, or here's what the data tell me, or here's what my constituents tell me. Whatever the right message is, neutralizing it and then going to your message. Questions so far? I'm happy to take them as we move along. Well, evidently, if you watch CNN, that's all they do is argue on there. I think they make it a point to make an argument with the people that's on there. What kind of credibility do you think that that gives them? Do you feel good about that? Do you feel like they got their messages across? No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just end up, I mean, I watch too much of it, but they, they intend to get an argument because they bring those other people on. They got both sides, and it just ends up being an argument. It, mm -hmm. it, it it's about the drama, right? right? And do we want to be about the drama? Usually not. Usually we have a message that we want to share. And I would submit to you that you're going to have a lot more positive uh, impact in the community if you're sharing your positive messages rather than arguing. Okay? Here are some don'ts when speaking to the media. Never speculate or guess. Sometimes you'll get a reporter, and this has happened to me quite a bit, okay, I'll, they'll ask me a number or a, an estimate of something, and I'll say, mm, I don't have that data, but I will get that to you. But don't you think it's about 50%? They, they, they need something now because they've got an interview and they need to get it in the can and get back to the studio or whatever. Don't speculate or guess. Say, you know what, I just don't have it and I don't want to get it wrong. I'll get it back to you as quickly as I can. Okay? Second thing, don't repeat or give out secondhand information. This goes back to talk about what you own. You own data about your community or your program, but you don't, don't own data about related programs or other communities. Talk about what you own. You won't get yourself in trouble that way. You know what you own. Sometimes we only speculate or have opinions about what other people own. Okay? Try not to play favorites with media. Don't give one reporter something that another one doesn't have. Now, that doesn't mean if a reporter has done some really good work and has got a story idea and comes to you, that you then have to turn around and share that interview with everybody else. Of course not. 
that's good reporting and you want to reward that by responding to that reporter. But if you're putting out a news release and you're proactive in putting out information, don't just give it to one reporter and not somebody else because you're mad at them. Okay? We want to, whatever news we're putting out publicly, we want to give it to everyone at the same time. Embargoes are okay. I don't know if anybody ever deals with embargoes here. We do at the foundation. A lot of times we'll pile a news release on an embargoed basis. We'll give it to a few reporters who we know will cover our information as well as our board members at the same time so that our board members have an opportunity to get their message in their head and their response in their head in case they get calls in their local community. And then we'll send it out publicly after that. Okay? But everybody agrees to the same deadline. The embargo is till. Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Nobody can release that story ahead of that. And if a reporter breaks an embargo, they're no longer on an embargo list. And we talk to them about why we do it, okay? What about no comment? What does everybody think when you hear somebody say no comment? Hiding. Hiding something. Hiding, lying, hiding. I would invite you never to use those words, no comment. <coughs> Just those words have that impression exactly what you heard here. There are times, however, when you can't comment on something. Try to give a reason why. Oh my gosh, we're not able to comment on pending litigation. We need to wait to see how the trial turns out. Or, I, that's private student information and I'm prohibited by law from sharing that with you. So try to give the reason. When I was at the Federal Trade Commission, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to comment on impending investigations. What I can tell you is this. And that's the key phrase. Try to always follow up that I can't comment on that because with a what I can tell you is this. On our way up here, I was telling Clay about when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, we investigated Microsoft for two years. And reporters knew that we could not comment on pending investigations. But of course, subpoenas were out there. And so lots of other people were commenting on the investigation. So a reporter would call me and say, I understand that you're looking at Microsoft for X, Y, and Z. Can you tell me about that? My response would be, I cannot comment on whether or not we're conducting an investigation of Microsoft. You asked me about this, some aspect of the law. What I can tell you is the law says this. So what I would try to do is provide them background that would help them with their story, but I would never confirm or deny whether we were investigating Microsoft. I used to get a reporter from the New York Times call me every day and say, I need your can either confirm or deny thing. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, I'll give that to you, but what are you writing about? Is there any other way I can help you? I'm building that relationship with that reporter. Okay. Try not to bluff, stall, or criticize. Try to have a positive message. And I invite you never to go off the record. Here's the reason why. Off the record might mean you can use what I say, but you can't attribute it to me. It might mean you can't use what I say in your writing, but you can tell somebody else what I said so they can get a comment on it. It might mean <laughs> you can use the general nature of what I said, but you can't use the specific quote. What the heck does it mean? It means different things to different people. And so that's a good reason never to go off the record. The other reason never to go off the record is somebody might break that promise. And if you're not comfortable seeing it splashed across the front page of the newspaper, the next edition, don't say it. It's just a risk. Now, some of you have very close relationships with media. You might, have, you might be friends and have dinner together. I have dinner with some friends who are, who are not with the media. And we have an agreement that what we say at that uh, dinner is off the record. But I've got to tell you, I never say anything that I'm not comfortable with being on the front page of the newspaper the next morning with regard to my job. Just don't do it. If you're an elected official, that loop gets narrower and narrower, doesn't it? Because anything you say as an elected official can be interesting. Okay. I just got a couple more things. When you are preparing for an interview, I invite you to write three key messages before that interview. Not four, not two, Three. Okay. Why three? Three gives you enough places to go without saying the same thing over and over and over. And it also is the ma maximum amount people can remember. Okay? So I have three messages when I'm doing an interview on our stepped up smoke free effort. A reporter asks me a negative question. I'm going to answer that question 
or if it's negative, I'm going to neutralize and bridge. Let me talk to you about the bridging statements that I find most useful. I cannot speak to that, but what I can say is, that is one opinion, but what we found is, here's what we believe to be most important. Let me put that into context for you. Let's look at the big picture. I don't know the answer to that. What I do know, others may be able to speak better to that issue. Here's what my expertise is. Here's a good one I love. The data tell us that, da, da, da. Data and research are less relevant now than they used to be, unfortunately, but it's still a very important uh, use, a, a tool that we can use, okay? So develop, write down in full sentences that you speak in your own speech, those three key messages and have them in front of you when you do an interview. And when you do an interview, Try and see how many times you can repeat those messages, even in a live interview. Try to get each of your messages in at least one time, and the most important one, try to get in two to three times. Now, you should be able to get in two easy because you're gonna do it at the beginning of the interview when you introduce yourself and spell your name, and at the end of the interview. So you should be able to get that key message in twice, okay? Set your agenda, your three key messages, and stick to them. You might wanna look at what happened? Why did it happen? What are we going to do in the future to prevent it or, or encourage it or whatever it is? But those are the what, why, and future. Think about your three key messages in that way. I am more than happy to take additional questions after the session or before. I know I had about 15 minutes and I've used that up, but that was a quick summary of a two-hour workshop that I do, and I'm here to answer any questions or be helpful in any way that I can. Thanks for the opportunity. This is one of my very favorite things to do. <laughs>